the Elder Scrolls franchise is 20 years old. 20 years, that's so hard to wrap my head around. I mean, I was barely even sapient when Arena first came out in 1994 and only in recent times has the franchise reached the peak of its popularity. I do know that there are much older series out there that kept up a consistent presence but this one always felt special, probably because the time gaps between releases were so huge that when one did come out it had so much impact. Now I am discounting the side games when talking about the Elder Scrolls because A, they were really bad with the exception of Redguard which was mediocre at best and B, they were nowhere near as popular as the main entries in the series. And people don't really remember them, which honestly isn't a bad thing since they kinda sit on the cash grab side of the fence if you know what I mean. At a superficial level, the Elder Scrolls games are free-form fantasy adventures that focus on player freedom and exploration with fluctuating amounts of realism. This harkens back to the pen and paper roots of computer role-playing video games. Given the fact that the universe in which the series takes place has overt supernatural elements, the realism is achieved through the game system mostly. Things like the fact that you actually have to use your skills to improve, weight limits based on your physique, merchants running out of money, etc. Which is something that should be applauded in my opinion, even though there are plenty of times when this tended towards the realistic can be damaging to the play experience. And it can also backfire in the same way the Uncanny Valley concept shows how the more human something is, the more obvious its flaws are. Take State of Decay for example, a post-apocalyptic zombie survival game centered on exploration and resource gathering. Here each character has a limited number of inventory slots and a weight limit based on their body type and this matters a lot because most of the time you are out there scavenging for supplies. And you have to make decisions on what you want to take and what you want to leave behind since every trip outside your safe zone could very well be your last. In the Elder Scrolls, by comparison, the weight limit just means that you have to toss your hard-earned items or do several back and forth trips to sell it all in the nearest town, which is a chore because there is no inherent danger to this, just your time being wasted. But even so, I will say that I prefer the Elder Scrolls flawed vision to the generic experience model where every single thing you kill gives you a set amount of experience that eventually levels you up and makes you stronger, in an almost cynical and banal Highlander quickening fashion. I'm going to say this from the start, Skyrim is a good game with numerous flaws that deserves its success, but perhaps for other reasons than the ones advertised and recognized by the gaming media. To understand Skyrim properly, you need to understand the context in which these games are made and the people who made them. The canonical face of the series nowadays is widely considered to be Todd Howard, but it didn't start out that way, even though he was there almost from the beginning. Arena was meant to be a gladiatorial combat game with some role-playing elements spearheaded by Julian Le Fay, a significant programmer in the history of computer video games, especially on the Amiga platform. But the project suddenly had a 180 degree turn during development, the game shifted from an action combat game to a full-blown RPG. Suddenly they wanted to make a game where you can do anything and be anyone in a medieval fantasy world but the baggage of the original gladiator premise couldn't be fully discarded. The name had to be kept, lore was quickly written in to give the world a sense of cohesion and random terrain generation was implemented to fill in the blanks between towns. Considering the time constraints and development problems, the fact that this game shipped at all is no small feat. But of course, this came with significant consequences, the game missed deadlines, was a buggy mess, a legacy that will endure, and its difficulty spikes made it almost unwinnable. So, in the end, the series began as a mix of single character might and magic, Ultima Underworld and randomly generated terrain and dungeons. Daggerfall is the game that Arena wanted to be halfway through its development cycle and this time they knew what they wanted to do and how to do it. The gameplay was more refined and balanced, multiple playstyles could finish the game without the use of a guide and there was an actual in-game tutorial this time around. Also, the plot was more diverse but smaller in scope, where the first game had you running around the entire continent of Tamriel for artifacts of great power to defeat the bad guy, Daggerfall is much more slow paced and laced with intrigue. The game takes place in one specific zone of the continent and the focus is on political competition complete with cloak and dagger type scenarios. It does veer into an end of the world type plot towards the end but it was much more interesting than Arena's tacked on narrative. The random map and dungeon generation came back along with fast travel because like in Arena the game was the size of Britain or some such and it was basically unplayable without this feature since walking from one place to another usually took hours without fast travel. Overall Daggerfall was the first Elder Scrolls where the sheer size of these games set in. It really seemed like a never-ending stream of content at the time, hell it still is, even though it has not aged particularly well for present day expectations. After a long hiatus during which an underwhelming action game and a really bad dungeon call were released,
Just like the previous entries in the series, Morrowind is heavily flawed due to the size and scope of these games, but there was such a strong vision behind it that I wouldn't call it an Elder Scrolls game at heart, not really. You see, while writing this I realized what an Elder Scrolls game actually is. It's an attempted simulation of the pen and paper fantasy role-playing games from the perspective of the players. It tries to emulate the freedom of being in a world that seems without end and that every direction you can choose has a plethora of encounters behind it. But that's not Morrowind exactly. In my opinion, Morrowind is more closely attuned to the perspective of a dungeon master or a storyteller. This game isn't about the fact that you can run out of town, fight the rat, find the magical sword and get surprised by a vampire that infects and makes you a vampire as well, though those elements are there. It's about a carefully constructed world with lots of different social, economic and political problems. It's about deconstructing and challenging the player's notion of a prophecy. It's about doing a lot of quests that don't involve combat that, that make you learn and question about the elements of this world. Which doesn't mean it's the only game that tries to do this. For example, Dragon Age Origins is also an RPG that tries to immerse you in a complex world. But the way it does this is so much more rigid and directed that it ultimately feels artificial and theme park-like compared to Morrowind's more organic and loose approach. It should be noted that Vardenfell, the island on which the game takes place, is one of the most interesting sword and sorcery settings in gaming. There are no dogs, bears or wolves, but there are nix hounds and cow goatees and alids and all sorts of alien wildlife. The Dunmer don't tend to cows or chickens here, but strange worm-like creatures that live in caves and that lay eggs which are one of the pillars of this country's economy. The gods of Morrowind aren't abstract notions that reflect societal values, but people with recorded actions who are in contact with the population, you actually meet them. But even that gets deconstructed by the end. And I think a lot of this game's merits are owed to Ken Rolston's vision and Michael Kirkbride's writing. You see, Ken Rolston worked a whole lot of time in the pen and paper RPG industry of the 80s and has a good sense of vision and scope, most of the time. And Michael Kirkbride is somewhat insane, but in a really good way and his writing really did make the world feel all the more interesting. Of course, this means they clashed with Todd Howard, the project lead, a lot on how the game should go, since Mr. Howard is all about the player perspective of things. Interesting adventures in a fantasy world rather than adventures about an interesting world. It's a matter of different priorities. At its heart, you know, it is this run through dungeons and kill things game. You have all these features and it's all kind of, there's so many things people get attached to, but at its heart, it's run through dungeons and kill creatures and take their stuff and buy bigger weapons and kill bigger creatures. For me, the biggest proof that Morrowind isn't an Elder Scrolls game at heart is the first hour. Every single entry in this series starts out with a prisoner being released in a violent situation and a call to action that he, she must answer, except Morrowind. This game starts with the protagonist being released from imprisonment by following standard protocols and you must explore the small fishing town of Seydanian afterwards. The first thing you learn about this world is its bureaucracy and its politics, not who or what you must kill. And I'd like to say that the spirit of Morrowind is fully encapsulated in one single quest that takes place in the first village, it's called Death of a Taxman. The quest is started by asking for rumors around town, to which the player will find out that the local imperial taxman, Processus Vitellius, has disappeared, presumed dead. A little exploring outside of Seydanian will reveal his corpse along with his possessions, money still on him. When you report back to the authorities, you have the choice to give the money back or to lie and keep it, which is a valid choice but things get really interesting if you give the money back and you try to find out who killed him. Because from here you'll interact with his dark elf lover who paints him as a saint and the man who killed him, a conservative dark elf that accuses him of stealing the money of the hardworking people and thus revealing the reason why he murdered him. Now it's up to the player to decide if he lets the killer go, but you know what makes this quest so very interesting? The fact that you never meet the taxman, you only hear the perspective of the people who knew him. And then you must make a moral choice, but like in real life, you never find out whether you made the actual right choice or even if there was a right choice to make. Oh, and the fact that both the lover and the killer are Dunmer and the taxman is an imperial also reflects the societal divide of Morrowind under imperial occupation, but I've already talked enough about this quest and we still haven't started on Skyrim proper. Suffice to say, this ambiguity of resolution extends to the entire game. You never really find out if you're the actual reincarnation of Lord Indoril Nerevar, the crux of the entire main quest, or what actually happened to the Dreamer. In the end, I'll say that Morrowind wasn't about the player, it was about a world, and that's why this game is my favorite Elder Scrolls game and one of my favorite games in general.
thus we reach Oblivion, which was oddly retro and modern at the same time. It gave up on a lot of the things that made Morrowind unique by returning to Daggerfall's player-centric focus, while also taking on a lot of AAA gaming signature traits, since a lot of the sales of the previous game came from the Xbox console. The people at Bethesda wanted to attract more console gamers, and at the same time, a lot of the people who played Arena and Daggerfall didn't play games anymore or didn't have the time to play those types of games anymore. The market had largely changed and graphical fidelity was more expensive than ever, something that the PC RPG market at the time couldn't really sustain. So Oblivion was released on Xbox, PC and PlayStation a year later, this time around, and it was clearly designed for a console audience. The chance-based combat was replaced by real-time action, something I honestly don't mind given the visually absurd feedback of Morrowind. The interface was made to be used efficiently, sort of, on a controller and the fast travel system returned as a way of moving to the action as fast as possible, the player being able to instantly teleport to any previously visited location. This console-centric design also brought on a lot of lethargy from the dev team. By this point, Kirkbride had left and Rolston did work on this game, but there was so little asked of him. This is mainly due to the fact that most of the development time was spent on achieving graphical fidelity and the game looked great for its time, but there was so little spent on what the game should actually be. A lot of it was developed as cliff notes, medieval European country, forests and mountains, wolves and rats, castles and peasants. The setting is so generic because the game was focused on the adventuring part and so little on the world building part. And the adventuring part was really good. I'm actually going to go out on a limb and say that Oblivion has the best quest in terms of interaction out of all of the Elder Scrolls. Yes, there are plenty of fetch and kill quests, but there are plenty of memorable ones which stayed in my mind. Quests like the haunted house in Anvil, the weird mind quest in Broville, the paranoid conspiracy elf in Skingrad. You could make an entire game out of the whodunit quest where you are locked inside the manor with six people that you must murder systematically, preferably in secret. But everything else takes a backseat. The world seems to be suffering an apocalypse, but everyone is oddly complacent. Skyrim suffers from this too. The writing is stifled and to the point, something which isn't helped by the small number of voice actors used, which I know is done because of the modular development cycle, but it feels very artificial after a while. I'm so hungry. He's a fairy tale. The Imperial Watch pretends there is a thief king named the Grey Fox. And the level scaling. I know people have complained about this for the past 10 years, so I'll keep it brief. It just makes things seem static, and it robs the player of a sense of progression. Now, Morrowind did have level scaling, but the monster stats were fixed, and leveling only increased the chance of tougher enemies spawning. You aren't going to encounter an Ascendant Sleeper when entering the Red Mountain when at level 1. There is also the landmarking, which is just not competent. Landmarking is, roughly, the coherence of the level and how well it relates to the player. The better the landmarking, the better it feels to navigate. Note that walk cycles and animations play a part here. Walk around the ravines called Foyadas in Morrowind, which are arguably the least interesting zones to look at and see how well the map is made. The placing of objects is rare enough to not clutter and choke the player, but play significantly enough to give the level cohesion also. Oblivion's map on the other hand is just not pleasant to travel, it's just snowy forest, swampy forest or just plain forest. It all blends in. There is no sense of wonder as in, hey, I wonder what could be beyond that hill, because you know, it's trees and rocks, it's always trees and rocks. But worse and all, I didn't hate Oblivion. It was enjoyable but marred by many faults and with the shadow of greater games looming over it, but I don't regret finishing it. And now, finally. Skyrim is the fifth installment in the series and has the rare honor of being a game which lived up to the hype. I'm serious, this game was absolutely everywhere when it was announced and was being advertised so aggressively. Of course, this caused the reactionary anti-hype to form and usually this is the point in the story where the game gets released and the hype either deflates because it's a good game but not the second coming of Christ or it falls in shambles because all that marketing budget was used to hide the subpar gaming experience. Not for Skyrim though, this game was regarded as being so amazing by so many people, both consumers and critics, that it just drowned out any minor dissent. 
But that was three years ago, and emotions have certainly run dry, which in turn allowed for the game's numerous flaws to be examined. There is even a post-hate Skyrim trend that declares it unplayable and the worst game ever, making up for lost time I assume, which by the way is incredibly silly and contrarian just for the sake of it. So, Skyrim is a really big game with lots of moving parts and pieces that combine together to create something that's certainly interesting. It's a typical hero story like 99% of medieval fantasy games out there, and it certainly does have mark appeal, be a godlike wanderer that shouts magic at things in a viking theme world while dragons fly about causing havoc. But the game itself feels so very… fractured. I do know that the Elder Scrolls are developed by a large team that has a lot of writers and quest designers, some working independently of each other, but Skyrim doesn't feel like a game where visions clashed or people didn't care, but merely like interconnecting puzzle pieces that were forced together. The place that this is most evident is the guild quest lines, but the problem affects the entirety of the experience. You see, in Skyrim, you don't play a character, not really. You play an entity that contextually changes its persona to fit whatever a prophecy or grand adventure requires. Individual but separate from all other personas that were before. You are the dragonborn destined to defeat Alduin. You are the warrior destined to redeem the companion. You are the novice rogue that turns the thieves guild around, etc. You are all of these, but only one at a time. No Elder Scrolls game ever managed to properly contextualize and fit the entirety of its quest into a single cohesive whole, you can become the head of every guild in most of them, but in Skyrim the separation feels intentional, it feels like a design choice. There are rare moments of acknowledgement, but they are so few and far between that you can play the game without seeing one. Don't mention the guild. In fact, it's better if you don't speak to me at all. This is not the place. I mean, there are entire threads discussing where your soul goes after you die, seeing as you pledge yourself to like two Daedri gods minimum, and the guardian of Sovngarde at the end of the main quest says he'll see you again when you die. I may welcome you again with glad friendship, and bid you join the blessed feasting. You have all heard the saying, Skyrim is an ocean with the depth of a puddle. But that's not entirely accurate, it feels like a vast network of interconnected puddles that you hop through, each with its own and separate microcosm. Here's an example. In Markarth, there is a chain of quests that focus on the local Forsworn faction. It has a lot of investigation and interesting dialogue choices, and it presents the Forsworn, at first, as fanatic terrorists and then deconstructs this by throwing you in jail with them and thus showing a repressed people who had their home stolen and their religion banned. It frames North nationalism has inherently hypocritical, and it even tries to engage you emotionally. I had a daughter once. She'd be 23 this year. Married to some hot-headed silver worker, or maybe on her own, learning the herb trade. The Nords didn't care who was and who wasn't involved in the Forsworn Uprising. I had spoken to Modenak once. That was enough. But my little Aethra didn't want to see her papa leave her. She pleaded to the Jarl to take her instead. And after they made me watch as her head rolled off the block, they threw me in here anyway to dig up their silver. But if you go outside the city and meet the Forsworn, who are the same as the ones in the city from a story perspective, you will find a bunch of barbaric Satanists that practice all sorts of disturbing magic. Suddenly, all that talk of religious oppression seems justified, ritualistic murders and monstrous witches do not generate a lot of sympathy. And this is exactly what I mean by modular, it's almost as if 50 different writers and designers were given the cliff notes of the setting and were told to make something, and that was added to the game wholesale. The result is somewhat schizophrenic and also weirdly morally ambivalent? Usually, in these types of games, you make decisions based on your own judgement on what quests you want to receive when there are multiple choices, but your journal absorbs quests like a sponge, without any sort of moral compass attached to them. One minute you are sacrificing your friends for power, well -placed word, well -placed dagger. and the other you are reuniting star-crossed lovers. I am so confused. What's happening? It doesn't matter. I'm here. We're together now. And we will be forever. It's really bizarre and it makes the whole world feel like plastic. And the game even brings this up at one point, strangely enough. And yet, you have done my bidding. Why, I wonder.
Also, on the quality of the writing, I don't want to judge too harshly, but the quality has dropped so much, especially on faction-specific quests. The mage and companion questlines are bland, but at least followable, they have a beginning, middle and end which is sort of satisfactory. It's with the others that things go oh so wrong. In Morrowind and Oblivion, the assassin faction wasn't necessarily evil. The Morak Tong was a sanctioned guild that targeted political figures as a way of avoiding full-blown wars. Political rivals used assassins instead of armies to settle disputes, and the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion was an embodiment of society's ills. They came and killed when they were called, and most of the quests of those faction focused on killing other assassins in the end. The Dark Brotherhood quests in Skyrim are just so unrepentantly unpleasant. You kill innocent people for the sake of money and fame, and the whole goal of the storyline is to assassinate the Emperor, not for religious reasons or the internal laws of your faction. You can just kill the guy that hired you in the first place just because you feel like it, but merely because because you want to make a name for yourself. The more I play this story, the more I found myself killing people that I didn't want to kill, and that makes for a poor assassin experience. Farewell, father. I'll return as soon as I'm able. Well, this is it then. Look after yourself, Gaius. You're doing your duty and I'm proud of you, but you better come back to me. You hear? Oh, Fida. I may travel alone, but you know I carry you always in my heart. I'll see you soon. Another story that isn't written well at all is the Civil War. The Imperial slash Stormcloak questline should have been a dynamic way for the player to experience this world. After all, a Civil War is a huge thing for a society in every possible way. Gothic 3 is a game that attempted this, and even though it had a lot of problems, it at least tried to have some structure. You have to go to each individual town and befriend their leaders and get to know the locals before overthrowing the established order or destroying the rebels. In Skyrim, it's kill quest after kill quest for the control of forts, and with two exceptions, you don't even fight for the towns themselves, just the structures outside the holds. Nothing changes by the end of the questline, just different people with the same lines of dialogues are the rulers now. And a big thing that bugs me, from a writing perspective, was Ulfric Stormcloak. He too is the victim of modular writing. He is supposed to be this hypocritical nationalist with a good dose of racism, but the game just doesn't portray him consistently in this light. The very first conversation that you hear him in makes him out to be a reluctant leader that wants to spare unnecessary bloodshed. I fight because I must. Your words give voice to what we all feel, Ulfric, and that's why you will be High King. But the day words are enough would be the day when soldiers like us are no longer needed. I will gladly retire from the world, were such a day to dawn. And that would step down if someone else could take his place. But lore descriptions and hearsay portray him as a bloodthirsty monster, and I'd like to say that this is subtle by the devs, but it's not. It's clearly not well done. Look at how Ulfric acts when he wins. He doesn't wholesale slaughter his opposition, and he doesn't dissolve the previous forms of government. And the first thing he does after his victory is to rebuild the infrastructure, not political purgings. The way the game was shaping him up, you'd think that he turns into a power crazed, mustache twirling tyrant by the end. So now then, I left the worst for last. The Thieves game is one of the most disjointed stories I've ever seen. Like, this was either written by 10 people or one guy with split personality disorder. Let's start with the first quest, because this is important. This quest should give you a small glimpse of what you're going to do later on and set the tone of the story. In this case, the first quest is to, and remember that this is a secret organization, go around the town and extort shopkeepers for money, by use of physical force or the threat of physical force. A truly stellar use of subterfuge and skullduggery, what can I say? And the story from there on goes to the gangs of New York, to Thieves World and then Indiana Jones. It's a mess, I could spend the entire video complaining about the writing in this one single questline. Speaking of quests, this is a good time to mention the Radiant system. Skyrim makes it so that, with the exception of important and specific quests, the location of the artifact or person you are meant to find is in a dungeon that's selected from a random pool of possible locations. I get why they did it, it makes repeatable quests more interesting and it makes sure that the map slowly gets filled as the player plays. But the trade-off is that the dialogue becomes a bit silly in the way it's non-specific and after you get the pattern down and you can recognize which quests are 
gradient, you kinda start feeling like it's a chore and it just reinforces the artificial feel of it all. It also makes it seem like traveling the entire breadth of Skyrim takes like 10 minutes. People will constantly send you to retrieve a silly trinket on the other side of the country, claiming they were walking outside and lost it. Again, very artificial. So the writing is subpar. What about the action? Well, the combat system has never been that good in the Elder Scrolls, and in the grand scheme of things, I prefer Oblivion and Skyrim's real-time action. It's serviceable, and it gets the job done quicker. I know old CRPG fans will jump down my throat for this, but old pen and paper RPG combat rules put directly in video game form weren't really that good from a design perspective. They were based on the fact that the audience already had familiarity and comfort from the previous titles and mediums rather than being an intuitive system by itself. With that being said, the difficulty in this game is rather poorly implemented. I played most of it on Expert and Master and I ultimately don't recommend it. Not because it's hard, but because enemies have frustratingly large health pools. Just set it to where the battle doesn't last for 10 minutes plus, that's your best bet. <laughs> I should also mention that before the Dawnguard DLC, playing an archer felt like an absolute chore because you ran out of arrows immediately and you couldn't craft your own. As for magic users, well, you're basically a glorified archer, yes you can have 50 different spells but really there wasn't any reason to use them beyond healing, protection and damaging spells. All those options blended together. But beyond that, the level design in dungeons gets really boring really fast. Partly because this game has you spending too much time in them rather than focusing on exploration and partly because what isn't a combat encounter feels like filler. I mean, you can run through most traps head on after getting a few levels, though I must say that sometimes amusing things can happen with said traps. And it wouldn't be an Elder Scrolls game without good old bugs, it's par for the course of course. Though I will mention that there are some problems that come from bad staging and scripting rather than bugs. Master, look. It's the file. What? How? Doesn't matter, look. It's refilling with your tonic as we speak. Marvelous. Oh. He is gone. So many times the game tries to make something epic only to fall flat because of the underwhelming production values. And speaking of underwhelming, dragons. This might be just my personal biggest complaint with the game, but you don't really know anything about dragons. And that's bad because they're the very hook meant to draw you into the plot, but almost all of the lore used here was already known from previous Elder Scrolls. We just get a lot of the hows filled in, and that's quite shallow. Half the fun of exploring these types of worlds is uncovering their secrets, and here there just aren't any. The story can be fully summarized like so. The dragons are creatures from the beginning of time that were put into a dormant state a long time ago, now they are returning and you must stop them by killing the big bad dragon called Alduin who is meant to end the world and that's it. It's very boring and quite generic, you aren't left with any sort of question at the end, a problem Oblivion also suffered from. But even more than that, the theming itself is off. Morrowind's theming revolves around perspective, a lot of history happened there and you get exposed to a myriad of factions and their interpretations of the past and current events. That and so much metaphysical context due to Kirkbride's writing. I'm serious, people have found Metal Gear Solid 2 level meta plot interwoven with Morrowind's narrative, like references to the construction set and all sorts of crazy shenanigans. And believe it or not, Oblivion also had some theming to it. It revolved around change. Change by destruction, change by betrayal, change by volition, etc. Most of the factions in Cyrodiil were in a traditional and comfortable state, but by the end of the storylines they are forced to change in some way, which fits with Meirun's Dagon being the lord of change 
and the primary antagonist. Hey, it's not Hemingway, but it's something. Skyrim also has some theming to it, which is surprising considering how disjointed everything is. And it mainly revolves around ends and rebirths. There are a lot of lasts in this game, and your intervention in the storyline usually results in a better outlook on the future, but it gets touched on so little. The only conversation that is actually meaningful in any way was with Exposition Master Parthronax. He asks you a very valid question about your motives, and with proper context, it could have been a strong point of the game. Drem, all in good time. First, a question for you. Why do you want to learn this Thum? Ruza, as good a reason as any. There are many who feel as you do, although not all. Some would say that all things must end so that the next can come to pass. Perhaps this world is simply the egg of the next Kalpa, Lean Vokin? Would you stop the next world from being born? Paz, a fair answer. But a lot of why it isn't is Alduin's portrayal. You see, you find out that destroying the world is what Alduin is meant to do and that he has done it many times before. But the actual character of Alduin is just this arrogant villain that more or less has generically evil filler lines. And that's a pity because this sort of villain has been done right before. How am I to learn his nature? Marduk destroys everything he touches. Is destruction all you have seen? You are a wizard, yet you see as one without the gift. Behold, and be enlightened. Now, open your eyes and see. I am no mere Marduk. My names are countless, my age beyond reckoning. I am the embodiment of all creation's ills, and my purpose is but a simple one. To annihilate all that is unworthy, all that is a reflection of myself. I think the moment where I got the most sad about Skyrim's potential was when I heard this story told by Espern, one of your mentors from the main quest. I'm gonna play you the whole thing to hear Max von Sydow actually doing some good voice acting. I want to leave my high place to seek shelter from what I, I don't yet know. In the manner of dreams I cannot escape, I'm forced to wait, watch, then finally Realization and horror arrive together. The orange is flame, heat. The sound, the roar, a challenge in their ancient tongue. And now it's too late for escape. The dragon is upon me, fire and darkness descending like a thunderbolt. And not just any dragon, but the dragon, Aldrin, the world eater, the dragon who devours both the living and the dead. And then I would wake up and hope that it was just a dream, but know that it was not. Dragons are portrayed as this world-ending threat that caused horror and fear throughout the ages, but in actual gameplay, they are oblivion gates that aren't as annoying. And just like the oblivion gates from the previous game, people just brush off dragons even though they are the heralds of the apocalypse for this setting. If not for the war, we might have enough guards in the hold to protect the settlements. That the dragons should return now is most unfortunate. It's just another reason why this world feels so much like plastic. Speaking of plastic, the Hearthfire DLC attempts to cram some humanity and personalization into a game that just wasn't made to have these things. Hearing orphans utter lines like this made me feel strange. You're the best! Can you be my father? And not because the jolt of humanity this suddenly injects, but because it just doesn't belong here. It's a game about slaying dragons and magical adventures. The moment I met this orphan, I thought, 
Why can't I use the entire mountain of money I own to take care of all of the world's orphans? There is also marriage and it's here I've stumbled upon something that yet again shows how poor the world building is. Homosexual relations in Skyrim are so much the norm that they aren't even brought up. You can marry from a plethora of same-sex partners and nobody will say a thing. Which feels like anachronistic pandering. And the reason it's pandering is because outside of this instance, there are no other same-sex couples in the world. Look, I'm glad it's all inclusive and such, but this is a medieval society with tons of social, racial and economic problems that come with that time period. And this feels like the ludic version of saying, I have lots of gay friends, it reeks of tokenism. But of course, with marriage and kids comes house building, which turns out to be a colossal chore. You can choose from presets, get the materials and build it, and that's it. It uses the same tile set and it has all the things a house you could just outright buy has. And the designers realized this because you can actually skip a lot of the chores by just paying gold. I understand what they were trying to achieve with all this house building and marriage and relationship and stuff, but it just doesn't work on any level. I mean, look at this father-daughter bonding moment. You got me a present? Really? Thanks. Since I've previously brought up DLC, I guess I should go all out after all, I did play this game to completion. Dawnguard adds some new high level items, craftable arrows which fixes a glaring design problem and a new story with a binary faction choice. Well, I say binary, but a ration is something like 1.1 different story. You can choose to be a vampire hunter or an ubermensch vampire that seems heavily inspired by some elements of the world of darkness. Problem is, besides some new repeatable quests, the story is exactly the same but you report to different NPCs. And there really isn't any reason to take the vampire story because you are provided with two other opportunities of becoming a vampire on the Dawnguard path. Are you sure? I'm willing to turn you, but you need to think it through. You've become the very thing you've sworn to destroy. The only thing I really liked about this DLC is Serana, a sort of permanent companion that is meant to follow you from the beginning to the end of the story. And she is likable enough, it's too bad that this game's technical flaws makes it so that she gets stuck on terrain and you won't hear her comments on the situation, unless you abuse the fact that waiting spawns your follower next to you. Also, the Dangard path is the one that has a significant thing called character progression. There you are. I'm... I'm back. All clean. I feel like I can breathe again for the first time since I was turned. And finally, there is Dragonborn, which takes place on Soul's Time, a place we previously visited in Morrowind. And apparently, Morrowind came to Soul's Time. This island's nothing but a pile of rubble. What's the point trying to make a lot? Don't like it. I hate it. So yeah, what's changed on Soul's time in 200 years? Well, there aren't naked people trying to punch you anymore. I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my shirt, so sexy it hurts. And I am too sexy for Milan, too sexy for Milan, New York and Japan. Also, can I note what a weird role Solstein played in the development of the franchise? The Morrowind expansion that featured it mostly looks like Skyrim, and the Skyrim expansion that featured it mostly looks like Morrowind. I'm serious, Todd Howard could have just given Blood Moon to the dev team at the beginning of Skyrim's development and say, like this, but more pretty. What I really liked about this expansion was it was much more compact. You got multiple quests from the same guys, and there are small developments to characters you meet here and there, it just feels more cohesive on the whole. Also, there's a lot of Cthulhu stuff which is starting to get played out in gaming, but it is visually impressive at least. Overall, I highly recommend it. It feels like a lot more thought went into the details of this expansion. And coming back to the base game, the details can be so important. It's probably the reason I like games like Vampire the Masquerade so much, just because of the small things. In Skyrim though, so much gets overlooked. But you know what? I realized something while making this video. 
A lot of what I said is valid, but it's also somewhat pointless, because everything is an illusion. And no, I'm not just referring to combat, which is ultimately meaningless because you can just open your inventory at any time and drink a health potion and immediately restore your health. No, I'm referring to the entire experience as a whole. Skyrim is something special in the end. And that something special is a culmination of thoughts and experiences that first began 20 years ago, when Arena turned halfway through its development and became an RPG. I said the Elder Scrolls games are based on the perspective of of pen and paper players, with the exception of Morrowind which is from the perspective of a dungeon master, and that vision still holds true, but something has changed, people grew old. When I look at Arena and Daggerfall, I get a similar feeling to when I see Doom. High school and college kids skipping classes to talk about their latest adventure and how to get past the DM's trap next week, min-max character sheets and lots of laughter over a table where they pretend to be someone else. When I look at Morrowind, I see drawn maps and entire notebooks about a world that someone created overnight for their friends to play. And when I look at Skyrim and even Oblivion, I see something else. I see 30 something year olds that are drinking a beer together after getting off work and reminiscing about that one adventure while smiling that their kid started reading the Chronicles of Narnia or the never ending story. Todd Howard is in his 40s and he wasn't the only one on that development team that was. Of course the game appeals to a large audience due to its nature, but ultimately Skyrim was made by people who didn't have time anymore for the habits of old. But they did remember the highlights, the adventure. And that's the way that Skyrim is designed to be played. You are meant to play it in relatively short bursts of highly condensed adventures in a world that seems endless. And it seems endless because most people got bored or just lost touch with the game 30 or 40 hours in and that was intentional because it could be picked up at a later date with no hustle. The game simulates adventuring for adventuring sake to the point where combat, exploration, lore and story get whittled down to their bare bones. You aren't meant to think about past experiences in this world or just to think about it in general. This game was meant for people who play 10 hours a week while relaxing and almost come in blind each time. After all, the franchise is big enough that the fans will automatically come even though it's not as good as it was before or as it could be. And there's nothing wrong with this, it's my expectations based on previous play experiences that told me that it was wrong, but the game is actually what it wants to be and that's something I ultimately respect. It's 2014 and Todd Howard announced that he was working on something new, but the the problem with the Elder Scrolls at this point in time is that it's won the game of capitalism. It became the king of the hill after starting out as a niche title and now others are following suit. My point is that the uniqueness of sandbox and open world games right now is basically non-existent. The market is almost saturated. The Elder Scrolls no longer has its own solitary spot of a specific experience. We have freedom but it's too unfocused and not substantial enough. Personally, I wouldn't mind if the series closed shop and something new started, but that will never happen because established fan bases like this are hard to make and Bethesda likes money. I can only hope that the next installment brings the notion of rebirth that Skyrim ended on to its full fruition.